Hello everybody and welcome to another webinar from the Paul Ecke Ranch. Today we're happy to bring to you another Sun Patients webinar where we will cover culture and all of the program and marketing aspects of Sun Patients. Uh, my name is Rebecca Simmonsma. I'm the Technical Services Manager for the Ecke Ranch and I also have my coworker with me today, Jack Williams. Good morning or good afternoon depending on where you're at in the country and again thanks for joining us today on this webinar. All right, thanks Jack. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, before we get too far into the webinar, I do want to cover a couple quick items. Um, we, can, we can't hear everyone on the call today. There are several people on the call, but you can hear us. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't want you to feel free to ask questions. Uh, there is a question and answer toolbar to the right of your screen, and if you could use that to post your questions, we'll be happy to address as many questions throughout the course of the webinar as we can. We do have some scheduled stops. Um, in between where we'll try to address as many questions and also this session is being recorded today and so uh, the recorded version will be available about 24 hours after the live presentation at www.ecki.com on on media which is kind of Ecki's Ecki TV or TV station basically and so um, don't feel like you have to you know scramble and take as many notes as you can because the recorded version is available and as always um, I'm available for technical questions after the webinar as well okay so we're gonna go ahead and get started with that um, first I just want to cover some you know kind of program highlights about Sun patients and the major things that differentiate Sun patients from traditional New Guinea patients uh, the first thing would be that they root very quickly uh, rooting time is two weeks versus four weeks with a traditional New Guinea patient crop. Uh, the reduced crop timing um, for some patients uses less energy yielding more turns. So you do have the opportunity to produce more crops in a season than you would with the New Guinea patients with the longer crop timing. They should be finished cool with petunias and geraniums. Um, you know when you're thinking sun patients think geranium production they like it you know bright and cool compared to a traditional New Guinea patient and so that also offers the grower the opportunity to save some money in heating costs. They do thrive in the full sun and have excellent garden vigor and throughout the presentation you'll see a number of pictures where you know we'll show various trial locations and some really great pictures of sun patients performing beautifully in some very stressful you know high light bright hot conditions and they do have three season performance uh, spring through hard frost. Um, in most areas of the country they'll take a hard frost and um, you know, you can put them out in the spring and let them go till hard frost and they will continue to show color through the entire time. So the first thing we'll do before we jump into culture is just go through a, an overview of the product offering. We do have three series within the Sun Patients line. Uh, the vigorous varieties are the first. Uh, these are the first varieties that um, were on the market and probably the varieties that uh, most growers and consumers would be the most familiar with. Um, there's vigorous coral with a variegated leaf, vigorous lavender, uh, vigorous magenta, vigorous orange, vigorous red, and vigorous white improved. And the vigorous series are the varieties that are best for landscape and larger container applications. And these are some pictures of some examples of how they perform in the heat. This is at our Georgia heat trials um, in Athens, Georgia. This is our trial manager, Jenny Buley, standing there. and. Um, that's vigorous magenta in the landscape and this picture was taken in the end of August when it was about 104 degrees and you can see that there's not a lot of other things that are blooming nicely in the trial at that time but you know these are happy and you this is just a really good indication of their vigor. I, Rebecca I always yep. like to point out that uh, when you see that picture of Jenny she's not a short girl she's she's almost six foot tall yeah. so it gives you a good reference point as to how big those plants are getting and you know just something they bear in mind because again um, that's pretty impressive size those are planted in the ground and so it helps achieve that size there but again think of that from a reference of how tall that girl is good point Jack thanks okay so we've got vigorous lavender here and this is the Dallas Arboretum in late October so you can see um, at first when you look at these images and you see those pumpkins there you think the landscape potential that they're not really that big but if you look closely enough at the image you can see there's people standing behind that vigorous lavender um, and you know so that's a really good indication of the final finished size in the landscape and these plants have been through the heat of the summer and the heat of early and late fall in October in Dallas and they're still happy lots of flower power you know great habit 
The next series that we'll talk about is the spreading varieties. There are two within the spreading varieties, and that would be the salmon with variegated leaf and spreading white with variegated leaf. And the best application for the spreading series would be um, in the landscape and in hanging baskets. They do have sort of a different branch angle that lends itself very well to, you know, kind of an undulating habit that you would need in the hanging baskets. Uh, this is a picture of it here um, in a you know, like a patio type pot, and then this is in the landscape as well. So you can see it's got nice habit for the landscape, but nice vigor for the landscape as well. Then we have the compact varieties, and these are the newer varieties that we've added to the Sun Patients line uh, with new breeding work from Cicada. And within that line, we have compact blush pink, compact coral, compact deep rose, lilac, magenta, orange, and white. And the compact varieties are best for your, you know, smaller t size containers like your gallons and hanging baskets. But they do have some landscape application as well. Um, you know, and in this next picture, you can see this was a new planting in the landscape. So these plants are not fully established. But this is another picture here of Jenny and Georgia. And again, as Jack said, she's a tall girl. And you can see that they're coming up to about mid-thigh. Um, that's compact blush pink in Georgia. And it's, you know, say, taken the same time as that picture of vigorous magenta was taken. So there's lots of flower power and the same height in the landscape. Typically, the feedback that we get about landscape height is that uh, final finished potential is about the same. It just takes the compacts a couple more weeks to get there. So that's a good, you know, don't discourage your customers from using the compacts in the landscape as well because it's a good application there. Uh, this is compact coral. Send patients also have some mixed container applications. Um, we, these were some hanging baskets that we show uh, that were shown at our pack trial in April and we've got them mixed with uh, Bacopa and Lamium. And then this is sort of a really cool container here with compact blush pink, a Selenia begonia and Papillon gara. Um, and you can see that the vigor of the sun patients has not, um, you know, taken over the other um, things in the container. It's actually balancing out quite, quite nicely. Uh, this is spreading salmon. Uh, stardom orange geranium, global merlot, ivy geranium, and then the stained glass works coleus copper. And you can see again here that, um, you know, it's not, it's not really getting away from the rest of the plants in the container. It's all balanced and nice and proportionate. So, you know, there's some versatility with the different varieties here in terms of landscape and container application. Uh, the really, you know, the spreading and the compacts and um, the vigorous varieties to a certain extent can all be used in containers. The vigorous varieties, you probably just want to stay with larger containers just for ease in production. Okay, I'm going to look through our questions here and see if we've got any questions that have come across the screen. Jack, do you have any additional comments while I'm looking for questions? Um, well, I think, you know, those, those last two container shots that you showed, those were taken at some field trials this, this summer. In fact, I took those pictures about um, no, less than two weeks ago, and um, again, it just to me re-highlights how they're a very versatile plant to be used in a lot of different applications. And what is nice is in these containers where growers are trying to use fewer cuttings all the time to kind of manage cost, it's a plant that does stay up with the more vigorous things out there as well. You can combine it with a lot of things, you know, even as aggressive as Ipomoea and not have it overgrow the container. So, you know, Growers need to key into how they can use these in, in as many of these different applications as possible uh, because, again, it does hold up, it does grow well, it does work together with that stuff and gives quite a good value for what the consumer is going to get out of that plant. Okay. I do have a question here about uh, the landscape application and production for landscapers, and this grower is wondering if production for landscapers would be best in, like, four inch in quartz or if uh, gallon production would be the best. Any comments there? Yeah, you know, I think what we want to look at is that clearly for going in early, if it's a landscaper that likes to, to plant it in and have it grow into what it's going to do in the landscape um, application, then the smaller the smaller pot's great. It's shorter production time for the grower. Um, you know, it's going to still get up to good size, and that transplant and ability to grow up is very nice. The problem I have there is that as we talk about sun patients, to have a lot of color on the plant, it's going to take a few extra weeks. And so if they're wanting more of that instant wow effect, you know, probably going from a gallon or something larger is a good idea. So I think the grower who supplies a landscaper needs to kind of understand what the focus of that landscaper is. If it's one that's doing a nice installation, planting, 
things are growing in. It doesn't have to be that first week instant color. You know, that smaller application is a real good way to go, and it, you know, the grower can get, again, get it out of the greenhouse sooner. It doesn't take as much space. But if it is someone that has to have instant color, instant wow, all that, going into the larger gallons better, just trying to hold it in the quart and get that much color to go on, um, I think is going to both restrict the size a little bit and also uh, make it a little bit more difficult in the transplant. So all hopefully right. those, those comments will help. Okay, thanks, Jack. Okay, it looks like we've addressed the questions that have come in, so we're going to move on in the presentation here. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Jack, and he's going to get us started with propagation. Okay. Well, as you know, if we can emphasize anything throughout this entire webinar today is that sun patients, regardless of how much they look like a New Guinea, they are not like New Guineas. And so since that's a crop that so many growers are familiar with, we are going to continually reference back and forth against the New Guinea to give you a an idea of how you should position there as a shorter production schedule. And so from an unrooted to a finished plant in two to three weeks faster than what you would expect, you know, from some of these New Guinea patient varieties. Where these, as far as going out in the garden, perform best under higher light and warmer temperatures, uh, um, those are conditions that you take. As Rebecca has already stated, in the production side of it, though, um, they can be grown cooler, more like a geranium, and less like what we're used to doing for New Guinea. So it doesn't always have to be up in the air, hanging in the basket to take advantage of all the heat that's rising. You can grow these if you're putting them in quarts or gallons or pots, whatever you're doing, on the bench with your other crops, and you're going to have really good results. It's a mainstream plant. It can go in and tolerate the wide range of conditions, fertilizers, temperatures, all those things that you get with all those other spring annuals and not be so finicky. Um, if there is any single message we have to emphasize over and over and over and over again is that this is a crop that should never be uh, crowded too much with the space and especially in the earliest development stages. A lot of the good structure and branching on this plant comes from having light and space around it so that it grows and, and fills in very nicely. If they're too crowded, you're going to promote a lot of stretching and kind of stove piping of the plant, and it's going to be difficult to get the nice fullness to that plant that you really want. So we're going to continually emphasize the need for space and being spaced on time as you go through the, the crop. As you get to the end, yes, they are going to fill in. It's less critical at that stage because the overall architecture of the plant is formed. But early on, it is critical, and, and you just cannot turn your back on this plant and think it's going to hold another week, uh, you will be sadly mistaken with what happens. As is already shown and, and can be emphasized repeatedly, this is great for full sun applications in the landscape. And, you know, yes, this question will come up. Does that mean the same thing in a hot, humid area versus a hot, dry area? You know, there are differences in the irrigation requirements under the different climates. But even in the hot, dry climates, this can uh, manage those full sun conditions very effectively. And um, Again, these plants, because of their vigor and, and the fullness to them, can very quickly fill out the landscape beds very nicely. So from a landscaper perspective, it takes fewer plants to achieve the job, and the overall satisfaction should be better. So now that we've talked about why they're all so different, let's talk about you know starting at the crop. For those of you who will be propagating these, bringing in under the um, cuttings, Again, going back to our comment about space, it is best to either direct stick these in the finished containers, which is going to be perfectly acceptable if you're in quartz. Um, a gallon may be okay for direct sticking. The quart is a really good size. Um, or use larger cells. Don't be trying to put them into a 100 um, cell count tray. At minimum, 72, even better is a 50. Um, just because, again, the space around that cutting so it doesn't stretch, doesn't come out of shape for you, is really important. What is important is that it does root so quickly. This is a two to three week uh, rooting cycle versus what you would expect with New Guineas in the wintertime, which would be anywhere from four to five weeks, depending on your conditions. They root so fast, and that will promote them to start growing and developing. And again, without that space, you'll get a very rapid stretch which will result in almost the palm tree effect, which is that tall 
a stretched out plant, a uh, main stem, then a whorl of uh, leaves around the, the tip, and it's not a plant that you want to go back and pinch. So give it the right space from the very beginning. We will also talk about growth regulators during propagation that will be helpful in managing and creating the form we want. Now, as far as some of the logistics here, no rooting hormone is really necessary. Again, they are so quick in their rooting process that that shouldn't be an issue for you. Light levels, um, again, we're talking about wintertime propagation, and so starting at a low light level, 2,000 foot candle is great. Um, but by about day 10, and at that point, remember, we should be starting to see roots and getting activity. It would be nice to start bringing the light levels up a little bit more. 3,000 foot candles would be great. Soil temperatures are important. We want to make sure that the root zone temperature is in that 68 to 75 range so that you get rapid root development. And uh, as the plants start to root out, especially if we can really start backing down on the misty, Think again that this is a faster propagator than other um, annuals, and so if you try to if you put it in with other annuals for week one when you're starting everything else, you know you're going to be ready to wean these off and have them off of the mist by the time you're just starting to slow down on those other um, different species you've got. So it might be the situation where you'd actually start it in the week two group that you have, so that it has less mist from the very beginning, and by the time you know they're starting to root out and you're slowing down on the mist for everything else you're appropriately slowing down on the misting. So, and too much misting in the wintertime especially will also cool that media which can slow the rooting process down. So avoid over misting. Um, growth regulation is, is going to do several things for us. It's first of all going to help prevent stretch, but also enhancing branching. And, you know, let us say right up front what we're discouraging here is the use of any floral or ethereal to uh, be used for the branching factor, which is something growers are very comfortable with when it comes to the New Guinea impatience. What our trials and our work with this crop have shown us, that is, we can get that same good branching effect, in this case using B9. So what we're suggesting on the growth regulator regime is for the vigorous, uh, which are the landscape types, or the spreading types, that uh, a combination of B9 at 2,500 part per million and bonsai at 10 part per million sprayed on the cuttings around day 10 and sprayed to runoff so you get nice, good uh, application through the whole thing will do a very effective job at helping to, again, prevent that rapid stretch that we're trying to avoid of that main stem um, and getting the branching to come out and be nice and uniform and full uh, which is what so many of you have tried to do in the past with Florel. So that application, day 10, that combination is very effective. If you are in the extreme northern regions, uh, for the growers from the Canadian provinces, um, or again, if you're, if you're nervous with rates that high, you can certainly bring your B9 down to 1,500 and your bonsai down to 5. Um, but again, getting it on there about day 10 is critical to the success of that program. So. Uh, use that combination, it will give you the results you want during propagation. There may be minimal growth regulator required after that, so this first one is critical. When we talk about the compact series, we're talking about um, a sm slight modification in the rates. We're still talking with B9 at 2,500 part per million, but bringing the bonsai down to 5 part per million. And this one we want you to spray about day 21. Remember, we've said this has a two to three week rooting cycle. So these cuttings should have rooted, um, really being winged off of the mist. You want to spray that about day 21. Uh, similar to what we've talked about with the others, a good application. That really works. The difference in the vigor of the genetics at this point is the difference in the reason to hold off and spray later on in the crop. And again, for the growers in the north, you can reduce those rates, especially with the B9. Uh, if you're worried about too strong of an effect. But again, with these, do not use Floral. Um, and there are a few varieties we will point out through the discussion today that are extremely sensitive to some of these chemicals. And Floral being one of those can really cause some uh, negative effects with the compact orange. So again, please do not use that. It just is not a good idea. Um, as soon as these plants are rooted, getting them transplanted is critical. Remember I said, you don't turn your back on them and think, I'll get to them next week and they'll be okay, because they will just jump on you. So you want to get them transplanted on time, or again, for the, the cords or 
content size direct sticking will help address some of those issues. Um, again, we don't want them held in trays, and that's why we've suggested larger cell type trays. If you think in your greenhouse the reality is that you will not get to them on time because other things are happening or you don't have the space, whatever that is, then go to even bigger cells and give them more space so that you really are not going to be subject to the problem of this you know, stretching and, and poor branch position as a result of that. So some patients have a very vigorous root system. We see that from part of the very rapid rooting. And so again, we don't want to get those cuttings sitting for a long time waiting to be transplanted when they're too root bound, again, it is going to slow the process of taking off and getting those new roots out into the container. Um, as you read and look at some of the cultural information, you'll generally see that the direct stick crops are as fast, if not a little faster, than the transplanted crops because of that factor alone. So again, don't hold them too long in the tray. This is a, a picture just showing you the effect of some of these growth regulators on the cuttings. Um, the cutting on your left, of course, is a plant that has not been treated. You can see it's, it's taking off and growing quite, quite significantly, where you can see that that combination with the B9 and the bonsai is doing a very effective job at giving us control, holding the, the height and size down. And again, that timing of that spray is so critical based on the series that you're growing. Uh, we can't emphasize enough the importance of doing it. Okay, it looks like I have had a couple questions come in here, uh, mainly just some clarification on uh, some information that we've provided. Uh, the last question here that's come in is the growth regulating that we recommend on day 10, is that after transplant or during propagation? All of the growth regulating information that we've just talked about is during propagation. So that day mm -hmm. 10 would be for the vigorous series, and the day 21 is for the compact series, and that's all, you know, that's that's day 10 after stick and day 21 after stick. So whether that's, you know, if you're doing the vigorous series, that's still going to be in the propagation phase in those 10 days. If you're doing the compact series and you are rooting them in cells and then transplanting, that application is probably going to be made, you know, after you transplant, shortly after you transplant um, when you do that on day 21. Um, let's see, I'm going to look at a couple other questions that have come in here. Yep, we've got some questions about direct sticking um, again and you know what would be the largest container size that we would recommend direct sticking in. Um, again as Jack mentioned, perfect for quartz. Um, you know if you've got some experience with direct sticking and are comfortable with it, it's also a good method for the gallons. Um, if you're doing in hanging baskets, uh, like with one plant per pot or three plants per pot per hanging basket, you probably want to you know prop in cells for those. Um, let's see, and another question here, do we... Rebecca, this? just to, to quickly address those, I think the big issue on what size container to direct stick really comes down to managing that soil moisture mm -hmm. in propagation. The concern is if you have a big gallon pot or big basket, it's hard to keep that soil dry enough, not getting it oversaturated, you know, and cooled down too much from the mist. That's one of the factors, if you can control that, if you can keep the soil fairly dry, can avoid that over misting, then you can direct stick in those larger containers. It's not a problem. But most growers, especially winter propagation, have difficulty trying to manage it that tightly. Yep. Uh, another question here about our experience with direct sticking in like the large landscape alleys uh, and just producing in the large landscape alleys. Mm -hmm. And if we are familiar with any trials where you know they've sold to landscapers and they've just plunged them in those large alleys, um, any and comments there? The, the answer to that is I have seen that done, and, um, you know, again, as long as it's a real large one, the key is that not having those too tight in the propagation so that the plants, because they do root fast and do start to grow pretty quickly, the landscaper can get them out and get them into the ground um, fairly rapidly. That's usually a program where we're seeing them go out at a warmer time of year because we don't want to take a small unit like that out into a, a cool landscape where the soil is wet and cold. Those plants are just going to sit there and be very slow to take off. So where I have seen that done with some landscapers, um, it's usually been for some of those, you know, maybe the, the turn after the early spring, pansies, violas, some of those things are coming in. The soil temperatures are up. It's warm enough that when they put those plants in, they take off because they're never too cold at that point going out. So it can be done. But again, the same concerns about space in propagation and not getting them too tight. Okay. 
One more question has come in here about those growth regulating applications that we recommend and, you know, just the approach that they should take. Um, they're asking if it's a cool rainy spring and you're concerned about spacing, you know, make the growth regulator application anyway, even if you don't feel like they're stretching or if your environmental conditions are good and you can space and everything, you know, don't do the growth regulating. They're just looking for some more um, kind of mm -hmm. advice on, you know, when to use that application and when to not make those applications. I, I'm going to throw out that if, if it's a cool rainy spring, I would do it because we know what happens then. The greenhouse starts backing up. You're not getting the crops out. You're not getting the space and things start getting held. These plants, we're talking very early growth regulators. And so you have the rest of the crop for it to develop and pull out of that. Um, I would tend to lean on that, keep it a little bit lower at the beginning as far as keep the height under control, rather than let it go and then try to have to fight it later on. Mm -hmm. We will talk later on about growth regulators that can be used later into the crop, but I still think under those conditions, if you think it's going to be cold, rainy, things aren't going to be moving the way they should, I'd err on the side and absolutely do the application. Yeah, I would also add with that, you know, in all the studies that we've done, you know, in the, in the several years of work that we've done with sun patients, we do know that that B9 application really helps with branching. Um, it yeah. enhances branching, and once you let those cuttings stretch, if you don't, you know, if you, if you don't make those growth regulator applications and you let those cuttings stretch, it's not really recommended to pinch to correct for stretch, and you're really forming the architecture of that plant at that point. So, you know, in the way that we've approached sun patients' production is just to plan on that growth regulator application and know that it's part of the culture for good branching and to prevent stretch later because, as Jack said, you know, once that stretch is there and, and there's poor branching, there's no going back. So, okay, looks like we've got, we've addressed all the questions that were, are related to propagation. We'll move on now to finishing and then we'll see if there's any unanswered questions at that point. I'm going to talk with you, you know, just about all the aspects from transplant uh, to finishing. We'll go over just, you know, some basic stuff here. A well-drained uh, media is always best. Um, pH of 5.8 to 6.2. So again, they're right in that geranium range for pH-wise. Water requirements. Um, early on, you want to avoid excess moisture because we're trying to pro promote those good, healthy, vigorous root systems. And when the soil is waterlogged, that's going to inhibit and slow root establishment. But once es once established, uh, we do want to keep the soil evenly moist. If they're allowed to dry excessively, you can see some leaf scorch, um, especially in you know areas of with rel low relative humidity. So watch the soil moisture. Um, they are big water users. Um, we're in the middle of a water study right now at the ranch and hope to offer some really good information about um, you know their water usage and and pro you know promoting optimum growth with water usage. But you know they they are big water users. So watch that. I think a really good way to say it is that they'll use as much water as you give them, um, and that will really impact the leaf size and a few other things to the plant. You can start to wean them off of that and dry them down, and that's what this study will really help us um, quantify and be able to validate for people how far can you push it. But yeah, we've, uh, again, I've actually we've really at, encourage starting dry. I've actually looked at some of the early stuff that you know we're working on in product development, and you can with you know, as much water, Jack's comment, as much water as you can give them, you really are going to get some large, fleshy, cabbagey kind of growth with a lot of water. And so, you know, that's what yeah. we're trying to do now is find that threshold. So with that, you know, and, and tone them based on water usage, uh, but not too much that you see leaf scorch. So uh, we'll talk about some fertility now. Uh, not in a, you're not real heavy feeders, 200 parts per million nitrogen, so a little bit more than a New Guinea patient. Um, Excess ammoniacal nitrogen, as with most crops, is going to promote uh, too much vegetative growth, so it's best to use like a, a nitrate-based nitrogen uh, stay away from like the 2010-20s just because that's going to help reduce the need for growth regulators and, you know, reduce the amount of stretch that you see. Keep the EC at 2.0 and below. Um, again, you know, if the EC is higher than that and we are allowing them to dry, um, you know, and we're not watching that moisture management, you could see some leaf scorch. In terms of temperatures, uh, we want to establish warm, just like we would with most of our spring crops. So, you know, temps 68 to 70 degrees. And then once established, you know, they're, they're pretty flexible to a wide temperature range. You can see days anywhere from 65 to 85 degrees and nights anywhere from 60 to 68 degrees. Um, you know, 
as we said before, they can be finished cooler than a regular nucleonium patient. So again, more like geranium temperatures. And you know, just when you look at that temperature range, when we start talking about 60 degree nights and 65 degree days on a nucleonium patient crop, uh, nucleonium impatients are a pretty temperature sensitive crop in that uh, when we start talking about the cooler temperatures, we know that um, it's going to delay the crop by a set number of days and all the work that we've done, we've actually have the science behind that to know how many days, you know, a one degree temperature reduction is going to equate to on a New Guinea impatient crop. And in some of the older varieties, you know, it could be four, you know, 30 to 40 days delay at those cool temperatures, but we really don't see that much of a delay with sun patients. You know, granted, when you do grow them on the cooler side versus warmer temperatures, you will see a little bit longer crop time, but we don't see the delay like we do in a New Guinea impatient crop. Light levels, as we said, um, you know, in production, they do like that bright light. Uh, they're hopefully coming out of propagation they should be established to 3,000 foot candles and you know you want to do that for the first couple weeks until you've got good root growth and new shoot growth and then it's time to bump those light levels up to 5,000 plus once established. You do want to avoid hanging baskets overhead um, that's going to contribute to stretch and you know reduce those light levels in and around the plants and we do also know that finishing under low light levels will reduce flower count and again of course it results in stretch plants so plan for these guys to have a space in the greenhouse where you don't have to have your hanging baskets overhead you know you've got good spacing and they're not you know even if sales get backed up and temperatures aren't great and you know the greenhouse starts to get full hopefully you'll be able to plan for these and have them in a place where they wouldn't be impacted by too close a spacing and they can be finished outdoors. We do have some growers that have finished them outdoors. Um, you just want to make sure it's warm enough. If those night temperatures are consistently cool, they'll probably be okay, but they're not going to grow and put on as nice a flower count. You do want to make sure they're acclimated to 5,000 foot candles before they go outdoors. As I said before, when we were having the discussion about growth regulating and propagation, pinching is not recommended. Um, on a lot of crops, you can pinch to correct for stretch or enhanced branching. Um, we do know that with sun patients it really changes the architecture. They sort of flatten out when you pinch, so it's not recommended. And it will also delay flowering one to two weeks, so avoid pinching. So we'll talk about growth regulating in the finishing environment and, you know, we've sort of stress the message about the early application and airing on the side of making that application and generally with a compact series if you've made that early application no additional growth regulating should be necessary in the finishing environment you know and as with all um, at, when we're looking at growth regulating applications if you're providing you know bright light moderate moisture moderate temperatures all those things that are going to reduce soft vegetative growth and soft stretch those things are all going to you know reduce the amount of growth regulating that you need but in general the compact shouldn't require additional growth regulating uh, we do want you to stay away from late growth regulators in the compact orange we have seen some excessive stunting and some flower distortion when late growth regulators were used on the compact orange in particular and then with the vigorous and landscape series, you know, if it ends up, um, you know, the environment's just not quite right and you are starting to see some stretch, there are some growth regulator options in the finishing environment. Uh, we've done, you know, extensive testing in the finishing environment as well and have found that a bonsai drench at 0 0.2 parts per million, if needed, um, usually provides enough control. And again, if you're a grower in the north up in Canada, as Jack mentioned, you know, you could think about an even lower rate than that. Uh, growers in the south may need a slightly higher rate, but it's, you know, it's been our experience to date that generally that rate is successful in most environments. You would want to discontinue that rate two to three weeks prior to finish so that you don't delay flowering. And then the vigorous red and the vigorous white, do, don't use late growth regulators on vigorous red at all. Again, that's, you'll see the same response like you do in the compact orange, some excessive stunting, um, and some flower distortion, and then reduced weight right, uh, rates on the vigorous white. We have seen that uh, the vigorous white tends to be a little bit more sensitive to that late application. As with the compact series, no additional growth regulating should be needed, but if you feel that, you know, again, if conditions are such that you're getting a little bit of stretch, the 0 0.2 part per million bonsai drench would be effective on the spreading series as well. And again, here's my disclaimer, highlight moderate fertility and the even soil moisture combined with good spacing should reduce the need for growth regulating. And, you know, again, as we said, the soil moisture thing, you know, does play a big impact um, on the growth rate of the plant and, you know, the leaf size and things like that. And hopefully very soon we'll have some really good information to offer uh, so that we can help you with, the, you know, the moisture management in the soil.
We do have some recommended spacing here for finishing sun patients. Um, and with the quartz, we like to see them on 10-inch centers. The 6-inch and gallons should be on 12-inch centers. The 8-inch should be on 14-inch centers. And the 10-inch should be on 16-inch centers. And again, you know, you're going to hear this message again from us. This isn't a crop where you want to try to cut corners on spacing. Um, ample spacing is really going to promote good architecture of the plant and a nice compact toned habit rather than stretchy and leggy. So, you know, don't skimp on space here with this one. Um, in terms of finishing, you can see that this schedule is based on direct stick. So the first thing I'll say is that propagating in cells typically adds one week to the total production time. And as Jack mentioned, that's just basically because of the vigorous root system. And when those roots really start circling the cells, it does take the, you know, the roots some time once you, once you transplant to the, fi the final container to get them to, you know, sort of work out into the soil. But in all container sizes, except for the hanging baskets where you're only using one liner, you can finish this crop in 10 weeks. Now, 10 weeks would be, you know, pretty good flower power, but not complete, you know, complete flower power. So, if, you know, for like um, certain retail markets, if you want full flower, you probably want to give them another week or two, so 11 or 12 weeks. But, you know, we do see that we have a saleable crop for the most part in 10 weeks on all container sizes. Um, and as I mentioned, there we do have... Uh, the, there is the opportunity to do one one plant per pot versus three plants per pot in hanging baskets. And in a couple slides, I'll show some images and some differences and, you know, something gives you something to think about in your own production. Just some quick variety specific messages that we don't want people to forget, especially when we're talking about growth regulators. The vigorous red is very sensitive, uh, again, so no late PGRs and also the compact orange. So stay away from late growth regulating on those two varieties. Um, the vigorous white improved is one that we, it does show some slight yellow modeling in production. This is a characteristic of the variety, um, so it's not, you know, something where you need to be concerned about disease issues or anything like that. It's a physiological disorder. Uh, we're not sure why it happens, but we do know that it grows out of it, you know, once it's in the field environment. So nothing to be too concerned about. And then also with the vigorous white reduced PGR rates. In all the pictures that we've shown you as well in the compact blush pink, it does tend to show a two-tone effect in the greenhouse environment, but under higher light outdoors, it is more of a pale pink and not two-toned. This is a picture that I was talking about here where we've got three plants per pot versus one plant per pot in the hanging basket. These are both on a 12-week schedule, and these are plants that we showed at our pack trial. And you can see that the three plant per pot, nice big plant, uh, maybe not even as nice a flower power as the one plant per pot, but it sort of gives you the opportunity to think here about the economics of the plant. And, you know, with the one plant per pot, it does add two weeks to the production schedule versus the three plants per pot, you know, but your input, initial input cost is less cost is less with the only with only one plant per pot. And overall consumer for the performance or performance for the consumer in the finishing environment is probably better with the one plant per pot. Eventually towards the end of the summer, um, you know, these three plants per pot are probably going to, you know, end up getting too big for that container. Where that one plant per pot, it's nice and it's proportionate and it's something that the consumer can manage throughout the summer. But it definitely gives you the opportunity here with a shorter production schedule, you could go with more plants per pot. Um, or you could increase your crop timing a little bit, less initial input, and go with the one plant per pot. We've talked quite a bit about their application in the landscape, so I, we do want to talk a little bit about spacing in the landscape here for those of you that are selling to landscapers. Uh, we do recommend three to five plants per square yard, and initially this is going to seem like a lot of space. That's one of the number one questions that I get. Uh, you know, when they put them out in the garden and they just think that's too much space, these are never going to fill out, but they do. Um, for the three, for three plants per square yard, it would, that would be 21 inch centers, and so that's probably spacing for the compacts if you go with the three plants per square yard. And then all the way down to the five, I'm sorry, that would be the vigorous, the three plants per square yard, and then all the way down to the five plants per square yard um, would be spacing for the compact types. It is important to let them acclimate for one week to 5,000 foot candles before they go out. And you can see some transplant shock noticeable if temperatures are cool. So if those night temperatures are still on the cool side, um, we do notice a slight wilt and it takes a couple days for the plants to go out. Another important note is just to really watch moisture management when they go outdoors and they will be using a lot of water those first few days. Okay, I'm going to go through here and see if we've got any questions that have come in. Jack, do you have any comments while I'm looking through questions? Uh, no, just to build off of uh, 
the last thing you said, Rebecca, about watching the moisture management. If those soils are cold and moist when the plants go out into the landscape, um, the plants will, as you've indicated, wilt a little bit. They'll look like they need water. Um, under those conditions, it is critical because if, if the landscapers keep applying water, they can get the plant to a uh, situation where they'll have root rot problems. So just because it's wilting, they need to investigate, is it wilting because of temperature or is it wilting because it's dry? And more likely, if it's cool and wet when they've taken them out, it's wilting because it's cool. And they should really just, again, avoid that. Let the soil dry, let those roots get out there, and as the temperature's warm and the soil temperature warms, they really pick up and take off. Okay. Okay, so I've got some questions here about the slide that I showed with the hanging baskets on the three plant per pot versus one plant per pot and what container size that was. I believe that was a 10-inch mm -hmm. hanging basket. Yep, that was 10-inch uh, that we showed there. It was 10-inch. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and those would be good to do one up to about a 12-inch. If you're going into a 14 or larger, then you're going to want to look at more cuttings. But that 10 to 12-inch basket is an ideal target for one, one cutting per you're going to the 14, you might then want to move to the vigorous varieties to try to, to achieve that kind of size and bulk. Okay. We have some questions here about performance in the landscape, and I'm going to let Jack talk about that because he's been visiting a lot of our trials. Um, this one grower would like to know about performance in Canada with the cooler summers and lower light levels, mm -hmm. and another grower would like to know about performance in South Florida. Okay. Well, those are kind of like the extremes, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah. Um, you know, I, I was... As I indicated, I was up in Canada just a few weeks ago looking at some trials. In fact, I did the trials from Canada, Ohio, Pennsylvania, kind of that, that region just a few weeks ago looking at it. And this year has been a lot more moisture, a lot more rain up in Canada, in, in Ontario in particular. That is that is where, again, the observations about if the soil is cool and wet when the plants go out, that you've got to be really careful about how much water you apply at that beginning point. Uh, to allow those roots to get established and get the plant growing because it will wilt, it will scorch a little bit under those cool conditions. And so, um, you know, good soil preparation is important. If you're in an area of Canada, you know that that's always going to be the issue. You know, then having them in raised beds or containers or someplace where there's good drainage or a well, you know, worked soil, so it's going to be real good drainage, is going to be pretty critical to getting them to take off and, and hold up. Those container pictures we showed much earlier in the slideshow here that have the selenias and the geraniums and all those other things, those were taken up in Canada and that, those were actually taken the night or the morning after really significant rainstorm. So what is nice is with the uh, moisture that's happening with the rain, the storms, all that kind of condition up there, they're really holding up the, you know, you get a little bit of flower damage with the rain, but you get new flowers right away. They clean up and and look really good in a very short amount of time. So, you know, performance under the cool conditions of the north is fine. The key is don't get them out when it's too cool, or if you do go out at that point, really watch the moisture management of the soil so that you're not keeping them too wet, too cold, and, you know, preventing them from taking off. Those are plants that should probably be held and taken out a little bit later. Uh, for down in the south, we have been surprised our heat trials, as, as we've indicated, are taking place in Athens, Georgia, and, and again, that's a high temperature, high humidity kind of condition. We've even planted fairly late into the summer, uh, as late as July on some plants, to, to do some um, comparisons with some other type of impatient crops out there, and have been absolutely amazed at how well they take off even under those high temperatures. Of course, there, the, the uh, landscapers are needing to pay attention and, and First of all, make sure there's adequate irrigation. That's going to be critical to get the roots established. And then mulching of the soil to protect it from the high temperature that the sun will warm it up to is also very critical. But we have been absolutely blown away by how well the plants perform under those high temperature, high humidity kind of conditions. You see that echoed over at the Dallas Arboretum trials. You see it echoed all the time in the Athens, Georgia trials. Um, this is one tough plant. And the key is just getting those roots out. And that is a lot about temperature, a lot about moisture. Once those roots get out there and the plant can take off, it will just thrive under those harsh conditions. OK, one more question. And this grower says, pick me, pick me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, um, <laughs> to address this question. Uh, this grower would like to know about performance in palm springs and desert environments where the humidity is really low. 
Ah, that's a really good one. And actually, we're, we're taking some samples over into that area. We believe that the opportunity is that it will be a really good performing crop through the winter time and into the spring. Um, I'm not sure that it will hold up under the high temperatures of the summer. I was in Palm Springs last week uh, visiting one of the, the growers there, and it was 115 or 118, and I'm, you know, it's going to take a heck of a lot of water to keep any plants happy at that, that condition. Uh, so we will be testing that over under those conditions with a few growers that deal with landscapers. And, uh, you know, we'll report back probably the next time we do a webinar to update, especially important as we talk about water management. So, All right. Well, it looks like we've addressed all the production questions. So with that, we're going to move on to program specifics, and I'm going to let Jack walk us through that. Okay. Okay, well, um, after week 40, the sun patients are open to all growers. Prior to this, as, as most of you are aware, it, it has been a program that was being distributed through very specific retailers, um, but it is opening up to the general grower community now, it's, which is great. It's a great crop. Um, so many people will be able to use it, people who supply landscapers, everyone else. But, it, you know, again, that begins after 40. So that's going to be the next uh, cycle uh, for everyone to grow and sell. So uh, look for everything available starting then. Um, there have been some trials that have gone out already. Uh, the key there is that none of those trials can be sold until after week 40. The pricing that is provided are landed prices. So that includes the freight, the, as indicated, the intellectual property fee, and the price of the cutting. So all of those things are, are bundled all together. Um, the pricing today is based on volume, and so there's, you know, tiers based on how many units you're purchasing. Um, if your minimum purchase is about 10,000 units, and that is the minimum, if you're at that level, you're looking at, you know, 0.354 cents, you know, per unit. So 35.5 cents per unit for the grower, unrooted cutting, and again, that's, that's delivered with the, IP, uh, the intellectual property fee. Um, if you're growing 100,000 units or more, then you see that price drops down to where you're just under 30 cents per unit. So uh, the volume does dictate the pricing, and those pricings are all provided to the brokers. Now, rooted product, um, we will be selling the majority of these cuttings as unrooted cuttings, but there are root and cell partners that we have licensed and are working with that will be carrying these. And these are places that you would be able to go to and get rooted cuttings. Uh, you can see the list here, and, and we have covered most of the geographic regions of the country and, and some pretty well-known suppliers that we're already working with and you should be familiar with. Um, for the grower who isn't really sure about these sanitations yet, you know, we're, we're telling you all these great things, but if you're from Missouri and you, by gosh, we've got to show you first, uh, you might want to bring in some rooted cuttings at smaller quantities. And this is you get the rooted cutting with the tag, everything to go with it. Um, but it would allow you to get the, the crop a whirl. Um, I think once you've done it, once you've found it, you're going to be very happy, and you'll, you'll see your units go up pretty quickly after that. We are really recommending that you try it. You've got to find out how it fits in your greenhouse, find out what your product mix and how you can present it, and also how it can go out to the retailers that you may service and making them aware of the performance differences so they can really position it well with their customers. Um, again, starting um, weeks 40, everything is available. Um, we do have trial packs. And these trial packs are in two groups. So the compact group, uh, there are seven trays, or 100 cuttings of each of the seven varieties. So you get to try each of the compact varieties, or the vigorous and spreading group, and that one has all of the vigorous varieties plus the spreading salmon. Uh, you can see here these are sold at the collection. You pick which one you want or you know, get them both if you want to try them all out. But each collection is $300. That's going to be the cutting, freight tags, um, intellectual property fees, everything delivered. It's a good way for you to experiment with the crop. You know, you root those cuttings, grow them, get them out there, see how they perform. Gives you a good baseline of how you're going to produce them in the future. If you're selling to landscapers, um, the landscape license must be signed. Um, that way, um, 
we know where those plants are going and to get a landscaping license or a trial agreement. Juliet Hedden here at the Ecke Ranch, you see her email there, jhedden at eckyranch.com, or her phone number is 760-944-4037. Uh, she is the person administrating those licenses here. You just contact her and that way they can get those. A, a big part of that is with the landscape things, the tags are not required. And so that's why we want to be sure that those are being sold in a landscape application and not as a container going into the retail where it should be tagged. And Jack, some clarification here, think, I think, too, because this program has evolved over the last couple months. Um, you know, and Jack mentioned we did have some trial material available leading up to week 40 and that it couldn't be sold until week 40. That was part of the trial agreement in that, you know, you could work with the material and have it in your own gardens, but you couldn't sell it, and that was the reason for having the trial agreement signed. Now that we actually have the collections available after week 40 and those can be sold, I don't believe you have to have a trial agreement signed for those. Those trial agreements, you know, those trial packs are just, you know, meant to be a trial collection for you to look at, and they can be sold. So you don't have to sign a trial agreement in that case. Okay. Okay. Um, again, um, the materials for, um, that you're going to receive are going to require tags. Uh, again, the disclaimer up there at the top, if it's for the landscapers, um, you know, or again, for the trials, those don't have to be tagged, and that's why you have to get that landscape license. But the tags will be sold at six cents, which does uh, provide on their date for information. Um, when you order the cuttings, the tags will be shipped from the tag company, so you receive those in conjunction with your order. Um, and again, those will go out to through the orders, they are variety specific. We do want to emphasize that Cicada has set up the program to be very friendly for people who are doing custom tags. And so you can custom design your tag. In that case, you'd have to let you, your broker know at the time of the order being placed that these needed to be tag exempt, so you're not shipped uh, tags with the cuttings. But you do need to go through the process of getting a tag approval. And the person for Cicada that is handling that at the moment is Jamie Kitts. And again, her email there is jkits at cicada.com. Um, so again, there's in, there is a process to deal with people doing custom tags, and uh, it just does have to be approved in advance. And again, reminding as you place the order for those things that would require a custom tag, you do need to place the order so that it would be tag exempt, so you're not shipping tags. OK. OK. And so you can see here just a couple of the um, the materials available, there's the tag, there are optional bench cards, and even optional pots available. So for growers or for retailers who want to have this really uh, shown so they can help get the message across as to why this is different, why this isn't a New Guinea impatience, why this has full sun performance, all of those things, these are all great point of sale type tools to help promote and help explain what's going on and why this is such a wonderful plant, so that the consumer does buy it and take it home and use it in the right way. And so all of these, these tools are available, whether they're required or optional, to help you carry that out in whatever program you're supplying. OK, now, if you haven't been convinced already, you need to go see some of these trials. And, and these are locations where there is plant material out there so you can see it in a garden setting or in a trial garden setting compared to other things. There's a full list here and again geographically it's quite diverse and gives you a lot of different places to go look at. Um, I, as I've indicated already I've been out visiting the trials and, and again this year I'm just completely impressed and, and blown away with by how nice and how showy these things look in the landscape. The picture on your left was uh, taken at Ohio State University in Columbus that was on the 12th of August. And you can see full sun conditions planted in the ground. Um, those varieties are, again, very showy, very full. You see the pots on the right. Those are large 23-inch type pots, um, very big showy plants. Um, those are up in the Ontario Peninsula region. And again, one area, Columbus has been warm and dry versus Ontario, where it's been quite wet and cool. And you can see. In either of those cases, uh, fantastic looking plants, great performance. So if you don't believe us, go out there and take a look yourself, and, and I think you'll be convinced. 
If you have program specific questions, um, our sales administrator that can be contacted is Eric Ralston. And you see here his email is eRalston at ecchiranch.com or his direct line is 760-944-4087. So any specific questions as to um, you know any of the things that you've seen that are sales related, Eric can be helpful in answering those questions. Okay, we do have one program specific question that has come in and this grower is wondering about the minimum URC purchase and the reason for that and um, I can just answer that quickly in that there there are several reasons you know why that minimum purchase has been set where it is but there are ways um, you know that still doesn't mean that you can't grow sun patients if you're not you know interested in doing that large quantity that's why the rooted cuttings are available um, from the root and cells and you know depending on the root and cell in which particular you know company it is you know they may have minimum requirements that uh, but some of them do very small minimum requirements per variety and then there's also the trial collection available the rooted trial collection and you know we don't limit the amount of those that you can purchase so if you're not ready to you know take that leap and purchase the 10,000 minimum then there is the rooted trial collections available you know in whatever quantities you're interested in um, you know to help you get started so uh, I think that's the only program question that has come in and, we, and when we think about, you know, crops, you know, again, where we've said this is not like in New Guinea, you know, we think this is a crop that has the volume potential of what growers are doing similar to New Guinea's or other major, you know, spring annual crops. And so those numbers, um, while, you know, on the surface seem a little high, they're, you know, when you start looking that across the season, that's not as, it's not as daunting as it may seem. But I think once growers try this, look at it, watch it, see the response by the customers to it, and their retailers, um, you know, I think those numbers are going to be very standard. All right, so it looks like we've addressed all the questions that have come in. Um, so I'll just end on a few final comments here. Technical support is available through some different avenues from the Eki Ranch. Uh, we do have detailed cultural information on our website at Eki.com. Uh, we also host on board our Tech Help Bulletin Board, and uh, within that we do have the Annuals Forum, and so you're welcome to ask us, you know, questions about some patients on the Annuals Forum. My contact information is all of, also available, our Simmons Mutt at EckyRanch.com or 760-944-4060. I'm available, you know, to answer questions via phone or email or the Bulletin Board. Uh, bulletin Board is probably the most convenient way to get questions answered. And then uh, Sakata has also launched a website, www.sunpatients.com, and there's a lot of really great information there as well. Um, a technical document is posted there, and so you should check out the Sun Patients site if you haven't done so. And then again, I, I have had a couple questions come across about when these slides will be available on the website. Um, shortly after today's presentation, it'll be packaged and uploaded to the website. And so within 24 hours, it'll be there for your viewing um, at On Media. Okay, well with that, uh, that concludes today's presentation. We hope you found the information informative and useful, and we hope you're excited about this crop. We're excited about it and think it has a lot of potential. Um, on behalf of the staff at the Eki Ranch, I'd like to tell you, you know, just say thank you for joining us today. Uh, we do have some future webinars scheduled on poinsettia topics and osteospermum and argyranthemum and geranium, so watch your emails for invitations for those in the end of September and early October. And uh, I'd like to thank Jack for joining us today. It's fun to have Jack in the office and, um, you know, getting into the technical support part of it. So I'd like to thank you, Jack, and um, offer you the opportunity for any last comments before we say goodbye. Well, it's always good to talk about these kind of um, projects and new crops so the growers really get the best sense. Again, as, as plant nerds that we most of us consider ourselves, this is really an amazing thing. It's kind of a breakthrough. You see it really with high performance and a lot of opportunity in the future. So we're excited, number one, that uh, people are, are really seeing it and getting onto the program and that the interest level is there. And so we're glad to be able to present these webinars to help out with that. So again, thank you all for spending your time with us this, this day. All right. Thank you very much. And with that, we're going to say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thanks.